Welcome to We the People devlog number 4. We'll be focusing on assets, maps, and environment workflows, as well as a small sneak peek at how our system and feature refactors have been going. This episode will be a little different than usual, and hopefully it will be the first of many like it. I'd like this episode to shine a light on our thought process, specifically how we plan to tackle building environments moving forward. And just for a bit of added drama, we'll also discuss assets and their purpose in various stages of development. But before we get into that, let's get into this episode's question. We had an overwhelming response to our question from last episode. All of you seemed to like the idea of dynamically changing gear, rigs, equipment. As long as it didn't affect the performance or drastically extend the scope of our development. And we definitely agree. Now on to this episode's question. We've had planned for a while that players would be able to use a hunting bow in the game. Our thoughts on this was that it was found frequently in the Pacific Northwest, where We the People takes place, and shouldn't be discounted as a feasible and functional weapon. What do you guys think? Do you like this idea? Let us know with a comment below. Now, onto an update, where we can shine a light on our refactors and progress behind the scenes. Since our pre-alpha build 0.1, we've received a ton of feedback, not just from folks internally testing and doing QA, but also from you guys in our comment sections in Discord. Mainly people feeling like the character was just too floaty and not grounded enough in the world around them, so we've begun a complete overhaul of player movement. Although this was inevitable due to us needing to bring replicated functionality to movement-related systems, like mantling or climbing for example, all that feedback has motivated us to better tune our movement. Here is Ian to explain what he's been up to and reintroduce We The People's movement system. For We The People, we have an ideal movement experience for our players that leans heavily into what we consider to be realistic. Being military vets, most of us have real-world experience running around with 100 pounds of gear trying to outmaneuver the enemy, and our goal is to recapture that feeling as closely as possible. To do this, we need to maintain a full range of movement concept in our locomotion system. Survivors and we the people will be able to crouch, prone, jump, mantle, climb ladders, and swim, maximizing the possible routes they can take when navigating our maps. All the while, our locomotion system will be monitoring the character's velocity, acceleration, and facing so that we can further represent the survivor's state changes, including head bob modifiers to the camera system. Crouching. Waist-high cover or concealment will be as naturally placed in our levels as gameplay allows, and we want the ability for survivors to crouch behind these obstacles when they want to. Navigating while crouched will be slower, with a slightly slow rotation rate representing the survivor's forward-leaning center of gravity. Prone. The prone state will allow for a survivor to reduce their identifiable silhouette as much as possible. We have a lot planned with Prone, but I will get into future plans in a later section. Just know that while Prone, we do not intend to reduce the survivor's full range of movement. Swimming Swimming is a gamble as many areas within our maps will have traversable water hazards, but to commit to navigating them will unequip any held firearm risking a one-sided engagement if detected. To be clear, walking or wading through the water will not have this limitation only when the survivor commits to plunging into the deeper waters becoming submerged do they enter into the swimming state mantling full range of movement also includes the ability for survivors to climb up or mantle onto an elevated surface like a car or a cargo container increasing options for navigating our maps ladder climbing Aside from mantling, survivors will be able to climb and descend ladders anywhere a ladder is visible on our maps. And finally, future planning and roadmap. Foliage and environmental considerations. We want to modify movement speed depending on what the survivor is navigating through. Vaulting. We want survivors to be able to vault over things like fences in a smooth and controlled manner. Foot placement. In addition to foot placement and slide mitigation, we want to rotate the ankle of the foot to match the surface the survivor is standing on. Ladder slide. When on a ladder, we want the survivor to rapidly descend the ladder with a sliding animation. Equipment modifications. Velocity, acceleration, and rotation rate get modified by specific equipment and the total of all equipment as the weight piles up. As you can tell, our movement rework has been quite significant and challenging. However, we feel bringing in these changes will result in a better, more immersive interaction with the world. 
From the beginning, a lot of our gunplay was derived around a system and framework created by one of our developers, Cody. During our long grind to pre-alpha build 0.1, it wasn't until we tried to customize and extend this framework for our particular needs that we learned a lot about the limitations of this system. That leads us to today, where the framework has received a complete overhaul. Here's Cody to talk a bit about that. The primary reasons for us upgrading to the V2 of the FPS framework are performance, extendability, and ease of use. Starting with performance, the main issue before, and the most expensive part, was the animations. So we rely heavily on procedural animation, and the way it worked before was everything was running in sequence, whereas now it is in parallel. For example, we have player 1, player 2, and player 3. Player 2 can only start processing their animation logic when player 1 has completed theirs. Player 3 can only start processing their logic once player 2 has completed theirs, so everything must wait for the previous character to finish. With the V2, everything runs in parallel. So starting with player 1, he reads in the data used for the calculations, and then starts processing their logic on the worker threads. At the exact same time, player 2 can start reading in their data, start processing their logic, and player 3 can start doing the same, all running in parallel at the same time. Moving on to extendability, there are no more classes to inherit from if we want to extend some of the core features or modify them or something like that. We can just inherit from one of the components, basically making a child class of it, and add the logic there. In terms of ease of use, everything is now component-based, there's no more actor classes, no more interfaces or anything like that. So instead of making several base classes that implement basically the exact same logic, the features are now plug-and-play with the components. So if we want to add a certain set of features, we add the component to the class, and that takes care of pretty much everything there for us. And that allows us to really just accelerate development and test stuff and tweak stuff without having to constantly re-implement the exact same logic time and time again. Now, the reasons why we the people will benefit from all these overall is one, we get a nice performance uplift all across the board, primarily focusing on the characters. So that could potentially lead to increased player counts and just other resources that can be utilized elsewhere rather than just on the procedural animations. The expandability allows us to really open up and just have more flexibility in what we want to do and what you, the players, give us in terms of feedback and what you would like to see. Now that you guys have seen what's happening with the framework, we'd also like to shine a light on some of the models being developed for WTP. One of our 3D artists, Sev, has worked on a couple badass models, like our Keter for example. But this time, he's onto something a bit more complicated, and something we're quite excited for. Here's Sev to talk a bit about what he's been up to. Hi, I'm Sev, a weapon 3D artist for We The People. I'm excited to show my latest work, the 6-hour M250 live machine gun. The SIG M250 is the latest model of live machine gun used by the United States. It is a direct upgrade from M249 saw, as they found the 6-hour design to be lighter and more user-friendly. Using a 6.8 by 51 caliber that scales more appropriately with newer forms of body armor, compared to 5.56 and 7.62 respectively, which is something I'll be excited to see get added into with the people. Speaking of the model itself, it had a lot of challenging parts to make with little to no reference. An example of this was a lack of information about the internals, like the belt ejector for example. In this instance, I tried to keep it as close to the real one as possible. Here I'm utilizing a remesher workflow in ZBrush, as it gives the best results for creating high poly models and is easy to export into Blender so I can convert it to a low poly model where the performance is closer to being game ready. Next step is UV mapping the model where we project the 3D model's surface onto a 2D texture image. From there we can begin to bake high poly details onto the low poly mesh, preserving the visual fidelity and texture quality. An example of this is adding indentation or scratches that show signs of wear and use from our fire selector, which is all handled in the normal map. The M250 model is still in the works, but I look forward to showing off more firearm models in the future. Hopefully this sneak peek provided a bit of context as to what we've been up to since our last update. And when those systems and features are ready to be shown off, you'll see more on that in a future devlog. Now, on to the meat and potatoes of the video. Up until this point, we've handled our map design in a fairly haphazard way. It was only in the recent few months with a map called Hospital where we started to develop new workflows for how we handle environments. With Hospital, for example, it began much like every other map did. 
I started playing around with an idea, doing some blockouts, and before long, I found myself showing the team an absolute monstrosity that I had thrown together. Thankfully, following that conversation, we began thinking, drawing up schematics, and creating a plan of attack. Eventually, we started building out the hospital, only to realize we needed a more scalable approach to creating and aligning the architecture. This led us to Epic's shiny new toy, the Procedural Content Generation System, or PCG for short. As this is a very new tool, provided in Unreal Engine's 5.2 update, most of our knowledge relating to PCG was limited. After playing around with it for long enough, Eric found a practical application for PCG as it relates to aligning our architecture. This was basically our second real attempt at trying to follow a scale system, to make sure what we were creating would be accurate to the dimensions we'd initially set, while also trying to look good from a player's POV in-game as well. This created a fun meme among us on the team, where we jokingly referred to the mannequin as the only proper way to discern scale. But jokes aside, this thought of scale began to challenge us as a team. We started to recognize the value in having one-to-one -one scale for environments, and because our intention was to use real-world locations as inspiration for a lot of our maps and locales in the game, this began to spark new ideas. And at one point, one of our volunteers, Alex, had suggested a couple tools that we could start using to more accurately capture scale, which from a level design and environment standpoint is a major win for us. Not only do we have an accurate representation of terrains, but we also have an accurate representation of roads, highways, freeways, train tracks, and even a rough placement of building locations, minus the appropriate scale. Traditionally, blocking out levels like this has been a major undertaking for us as a team, and now it's something we can get done in a matter of hours. As great as this sounds, how do we use this expedited workflow to our advantage? Well, for starters, we know we want to make big, beautiful maps, but finding the right approach to tackle creating them is crucial for a small team like ours. So, setting small attainable goals along the way is very important. This allows our scope to be narrow, while also thinking and considering the bigger picture. I'll explain further. Take the map port, for example, something we've only had in concept up until we implemented this new workflow. And using that new workflow, we now have a one-to-one -one blockout of the entire port. However, deciding where to begin is challenging. This is where a think smarter, not harder approach will serve us well. The long-term dream is to have a lot of large maps, like Port, but due to scope and the short-term reality that we only have a few people able to work on maps, we have to get creative and think outside of the box. We know we want this, large massive map, but we need to think practically one section at a time. And because of this macro-micro approach to handling map development, we're actually knocking out two birds with one stone. Creating these smaller size POIs within the broader map will give us the ability to test out both our extraction and arena gameplay loops, as well as refine the rule set and systems involved in both. It will also give us the opportunity to focus on establishing and refining the infrastructure for matchmaking and dedicated servers, which will hopefully lead to more polished multiplayer playtests when that time comes. Now that you know the methods we intend to utilize when creating these environments, let's give a preview of the train yard POI on port to give an example of how all these concepts culminate into something closer to being game ready. Another very important aspect of creating these environments is how we intend to populate them, which leads us to something a little more controversial, assets. And I know, before you guys get out the torches and pitchforks, let me explain. In our eyes, there's a few approaches to utilizing assets in a meaningful way. There's also some pretty bad methods to utilizing them, as many of us have seen over the course of the last year or so. Now, we're not here to name names or talk shit, but I'll say this. 
There is an appropriate way to utilize assets. It should be obvious to most that small studios comprised of volunteers and contract hires lack the infrastructure to uniquely create everything on their own. But do small studios lack the creativity necessary to appropriately use assets? Hell no. That's what makes something like the M250 model we showed off earlier so special. It was made uniquely for We The People. But what about assets not uniquely made for We The People? Well, very rarely would you get a team willing to be transparent about their use of assets, despite almost everyone in the industry, from indie to AAA titles engaging in the practice frequently. However, if it's not obvious by now, our goal is to bring you along for our journey. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, to lift the veil a bit, I'd like to showcase an example of our mentality when it comes to assets. Now, this might be a hot take, but whether it be for prototyping a concept or idea, or even to ship in early access, we believe assets should be handled with a little bit of caution, but not entirely discounted. Here's what I mean. There's no doubt it's a great thing to be able to buy a pack of props and place them around our world. And, much like hiring an environment artist, you're exchanging money for art, literally. That, however, does come with trade-offs. You may save time and potentially save money, but you lose out on the uniqueness factor of that asset. It's a lot less cool when you know everyone and their mom is using the same trees, roads, or buildings. This is where we feel a bit of creativity goes a long way. Take this truck, for example. Fairly unassuming, but not exactly what we'd want to place around the world. However, what can we do to think outside of the box in order to utilize it effectively in our environment? Well, first, let's deconstruct the truck a little. Under the hood, we've got some interesting parts. Parts I know I would like to scatter around as they fit within our lore for the area and match the intended aesthetic. Using the in-engine modeling tool, I can go through and modify this asset, creating a variety of assets in ways that were never intended. Take this pile of bricks. It's okay looking, but far too uniform for the aesthetic we're going for. That's where the in-engine modeling tool once again comes in handy. We can transform something from bland to visually pleasing with a little bit of effort. Another great example of this is our makeshift buildings comprised of metal containers. Although nice looking, they were never intended to be viewed from the inside, as you can tell by the see-through vertices. Not only does that limit the visual and aesthetic use of the model, but most importantly, it has real gameplay implications. For example, our ballistic system wouldn't be able to register this as a metal surface, and any round shot into it would go right through as if nothing was there, because nothing is there. That's where a bit of creativity goes a long way. Eric was able to export this model, add verts to the internals, and create a fully accessible metal container from something that was originally only intended to be viewed from the outside. He then created a blueprint, allowing for a bit of modularity, giving us the ability to open and close the doors as necessary. We can then stack these metal containers and create unique makeshift buildings out of them. Badass, right? When it comes to assets like these, taking an unconventional approach to using what we have at our disposal is very important. Not just because players can tell when something was done with effort or not, but also because it's essential that we get the right aesthetic, look, and feel for our environments to better tell the story of We The People. And speaking of the story, Something else we're trying to do when designing and building environments is understanding a map's narrative purpose within the world we are creating. Here's one of our writers, James, to talk a little bit about Port's lore. What is Port? It was one of the largest shipping hubs in the region prior to the HVDO's intervention, home to many industries, especially those involved in importing, exporting, transport, or storage of both industrial and commercial goods. As the region destabilized, various factions found themselves scrambling for control of the port. Some using the initial stages of containment and lockdown measures as an opportunity to usurp control of the port's many industrial facilities. As time progressed, the world provided more authority to the HVDO, which took it upon itself to establish control of specific assets in the region as a response to the outbreak of Medina One. This includes a commandeered warehouse turned medical storage facility nestled within the heart of port. After initially leaning on the help of PMCs to safeguard their presence during the heights of the Medina 1 crisis, it wasn't until Medina 2 surfaced that the HVDO abruptly left and disassociated with their former PMC allies. At present day in-game, port is still a highly contested and active area 
PMC groups like the Tenebris Company, for example, control key strategic areas within the port that allows for importing supplies and exporting munitions and other nefarious goods. Various factions have turned port into a contested staging ground. This has made all those in the region set their eyes on the port not only as a potential hub for resources, but also as a seat of power in the region. Due to its strategic positioning and limited points of entry, the Tenebris Company has staked their claim and aggressively protected its borders around the train yard. This fortress also houses their ill-gotten goods and stashes of medical supplies and a small army's worth of munitions. Port provides a staging ground for surgical strikes into the city proper, while also providing them access to the sea. It has even been rumored that they've gone as far as to take small tactical watercrafts to assault other ships at sea, adding to their list of heinous activities, piracy. While Tenebra's company is an outright invasive or occupying force on the mainland, no one knows who they serve, but it is universally known that wherever you find them, there's usually a money trail that follows. However, it has been said that on occasion, entrepreneurial PMCs make trade with remnant survivor groups, usually at an upcharged price. Those with a careful or discerning eye may find more than just graffitied symbols on walls, connexes, and vehicles. Those judicious survivors bold enough to take their time scouring shelves, drawers, cabinets, crates, and the like will find themselves collecting and piecing together a much larger picture of the world within We the People. We hope you enjoyed this episode and are as excited for future updates as we are. Moving forward, we'd like to spend more time showing off the world we're creating. So if map showcases, lore deep dives, and time-lapse footage of firearms being modeled is something that interests you, let us know and comment something positive down below. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our patrons supporting the project. Thanks for joining us on this journey. As always, likes are appreciated. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on our socials to keep up to date with everything we're doing in between these devlog updates. Please also give We The People a wishlist on Steam. And once again, thank you for watching.